Well, good morning. I hope you can hear me properly. Thank you so much, Juanjo, for the for your introduction and thank you for organizing this conference and counting on us. I am Oriol Comas. I'm an associate professor, post PhD researcher in the a food campus at the University of Barcelona and member of our research of the group uh, directed by Carmen Vidal, where, as Juan Joduelo said, I had my I did my PhD and thesis on histamine intolerance. The title of my presentation is Unfolding New Evidence on DIY Deficiency, which is a development of new evidence on these DAO enzyme deficit. And I would like to mention some of the most recent uh, pieces of work that offer the scientific evidence on to know how to better treat this histamine intolerance by DAO deficiency. When we talk about uh, histamine intolerance, and this is something that uh, Vidal, uh, Dr. Vidal showed already, we say it's a relatively new disorder. It's a 21st century disorder. Obviously, as she said, this existed before, but we didn't start talking about the role of uh, this DAO enzyme until the end of the, of the 20th century. And more precisely, a group of uh, Austrian and German researchers then from 1980 and 1990, they carried out the first uh, works that talk about the role of this enzyme. They talk about uh, food-induced histaminosis. And they said how this oral histamine and the blockage of these DAO enzyme provoked a high level of plasma, uh, a high level of these enzyme in plasma, and that uh, these were the first pieces of work that talked about the role of DAO. But as the graphic shows, it's not until the last decade that we had this uh, progressive and even exponential growth um, scientific literature on uh, DAO and histamine. And also in the last uh, five years, it's a significant growth. So we can say that this uh, histamine disorder is a relatively new one and is a uh, gathering interest by the scientific community. And we can see this. I wanted to update the graphic uh, yesterday. So I have here 2021 and on to say that in the, um, this, in the last uh, 10 months, many uh, work has been published on this DAO deficiency more than the ones that were published from 2001 to 2010. But apart, uh, in spite of all these scientific advances, there is still the need to have a consensus on diagnosis and this affects patients because the symptoms are unspecific and we don't have many um, diagnosis tools. So it's like, so that leads to doctor shopping, which is uh, going to different specialists searching for an explanation on an efficient treatment for the varied symptomatology. And these affect uh, patients most of all. Uh, currently, diagnosis is based on uh, clinical manifestations of the patient because we do not have a validated questionnaire or a routine test that offers an, an exact diagnosis. The combination is the, uh, uh, the appearance of clinical manifestations to three or more symptoms. There are um, discrepancies in the number of uh, symptoms, but a minimum of two or three and also excluding other related um, disorders like uh, systemic mastocytosis or other allergies, other gastrointestinal pathologies that might cause this um, symptomatology or excluding the intake of uh, inhibiting uh, drugs. So we would have to exclude this to uh, discharge these um these uh, symptoms. So what are the symptoms? Well, here you can see a graphic um, summary of those and manifestations would be basically a wide range of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, but also um, extra intestinal symptoms, which are non-specific. And this is due to the distribution of the four histamine receptors of the organism, because they are in different tissues and organs. Uh, we have gastrointestinal symptoms, also respiratory symptoms, uh, uh, circulate, circulatory ones. And these remind us to those that they, they've shown us before of histamine intoxication or also allergy-related symptoms, because we have to remember that it's the same cause, histamine, and the same histamine receptors uh, with which it's going to be um, interacting. 
And I like to also talk about this uh, study published very recently by a research um, team in Austria, among them Dr. Snedel, who will be with us in the next roundtable, who uh, very um, comprehensively, comprehensively analyzed many patients with uh, this histamine intolerance and the most severe symptoms were gastrointestinal ones, uh, abdominal distension, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating in more than 70% of patients. And it also had other nervous system sim symptom, symptoms, for example, dizziness and headaches and with also uh, respiratory symptoms and dermatological ones. Also, it's important to say that in 90% of cases, there was a combination of them. And you can see that in this graphic. 97% of cases um, reported um, experiencing uh, or suffering from three or more symptoms. So that reflects the complexity of this clinical, the complexity of this uh, clinical um, uh, format. Well, these are not very severe symptoms. It's a combination of them. Uh, which makes, uh, which leads to a loss of the quality of life of patients. Apart from the symptoms, um, there is a confirmation test, which is the assessment of the remission of these uh, symptoms after a low histamine diet. The duration of the diet is not very well established, but we've seen that at least we would need to have a low histamine diet for one or two months, and that would lead to an improvement. Um, so eliminating histamine from diet, uh, then seeing if there is an improvement, then that's an, a, another way of uh, knowing about it. And also we could try the effect of uh, offering anti-histamine um, drugs to fight symptoms, although it's not 100% clear how useful that would be. Once um, histamine or um, dietary histamine is responsible for these symptoms, the diagnosis of this uh, disorder would be um, tested, but we need to have another marker. And so in the last few years, we've been proposing and studying certain uh, kinds of uh, complementary tests, which have, have not been officially uh, uh, um, tested or, or, or assessed. But what we want to do is in the future to have a, a definite diagnosis of this DAO deficiency. I'm going to mention some of the tests that are, have already been used in clinical practice. One of the most studied and maybe the most controversial one is the determination of DAO activity in plasma. This analytical test would be measuring the quantity of histamine that can be degraded in a certain period of time. And currently you have them available in the market. So ELISA kit or another kind of tests. The scientific uh, evidence of the validity of this uh, test is not um, concluding or, or is not enough, but this would be a very interesting marker. I think that uh, nowadays there are two points that have to be improved. On the one hand, uh, the high variability of the, of the trials and the levels of doubt obtained. And on the other hand, the lack of a well-established uh, normality uh, range so the levels of the healthy population, and then with this, we would have from what level um, we would consider it to be a deficiency. But there are um, already many studies that have identified a percentage of uh, prevalence of DAO in blood in different populations. And I wanted to highlight these three uh, works by the center. These uh, three works studied patients with uh, varied symptoms, two or more. And in these patients, they found a percentage of prevalence in plasma of uh, between 64 and 80 percent. And here we can see high percentages of prevalence in patients with neurological um, neurological symptoms and a wider variety in the dermatological symptoms. And I wanted to highlight this work, which is uh, very recent, which appeared a few days ago, in which they studied uh, patients with allergic rhinitis, and those had an enzymatic activity, a DAO activity, which was lower than those who had less severe symptoms. And this is logical. If you have a higher accumulation of histamine, the gravity and the, 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 um, the severeness of uh, the symptoms would be higher as well. 
in spite of these variable percentages in DAO deficit or deficiency, all studies seem to show that there is a relation between this DAO deficiency and other symptoms and or disorders that are related to this histamine intolerance. Another approximation, which is linked to the measurement of DAO activity, not in the blood, but also at a bowel level. We can do that with a, a column uh, biopsia. This would be a diagnosis uh, criteria as well, but it's more invasive. There are not many studies, but those that mm, are show a reduction of symptoms in patients with urticaria, a food allergy, or colon adenoma. Among those, the work done by uh, this, Ray and co, that showed how this enzyme activity evolved in the um, intestine. And in the ileum and the first part of the column, we saw that activity, which was reduced until that we got to the area of the rectum. That has allowed us to know about this DAO activity. And although the diagnostic potential of this test is evident, we still need more studies to relate the clinical action of this and the symptoms of uh, DAO deficiency. We think that this test is very interesting because it's showing the DAO activity not in the blood, but at a, at an, um, at a bowel or an intestinal level. Another uh, test proposed is a variation of the intradermic test, histamine skin prick test. This technique is uh, leaving a substance uh, for example, histamine, well, that would be histamine on the skin of the, of the arm, and this is going to produce a reaction, a little rash. There are only two works, but in 2011, we already had a work that assessed the usefulness of this uh, test in the diagnosis, and it showed that the evolution of the rash generated by this test was lower uh, in those patients we had, which had a histamine intolerance. So 82% of patients still showed the rash after uh, 50 minutes. Uh, and, and we have to remember that this test uh, for allergy is usually done for uh, 20 minutes. And, and they saw that 50 minutes later, those patients that had symptoms of histamine intolerance had this rash uh, in 2019. A research group in Poland reassessed this uh, skin test with patients with histamine intolerance, and they observed this correlation between the uh, delay in the, in the disappearance of the rash and a high concentration of histamine in blood. We can see that in this uh, graphic. So patients that find it more difficult to make the rash disappear, those are the ones that have uh, a lower DAO activity and a higher concentration of histamine in the blood. So that's a diagnostic um, approach, which is very interesting. There are only two studies and we have to carry out more, but these could be very useful at a diagnostic and practical level. Another possible uh, approach to improve this diagnosis of histamine is the use of uh, a metabolome in order to identify biomarkers. And this comes from the hypothesis of uh, people having a profile of, uh, of urinary um, excretion of histamine, which would be different. So we developed a method, a chromatographic method, that would um, show the amount of histamine, methyl histamine in the urine. So there you can see that this is what is a methyl histamine is uh, due to the work of these enzyme HNMT. So we can identify those two compounds in the urine. We had 87 uh, um, individuals, 55 were healthy and 32 had a diagnosis of histamine intolerance through the uh, presentation of uh, clinical manifestations and most of them with the DAO activity deficit or deficiency. Here we have on the right hand we have the symptoms and they coincide with uh, most of the symptoms, gastrointestinal ones, 100%, also dermatological ones and, and respiratory ones. And 95% of our patients suffered from the combination of three or more symptoms. So we can see how uh, a pattern is uh, constantly repeated. 
in patients with histamine intolerance. So first, what we did is study what, what was a kind of a, the best uh, urine um, sample needed. So we compared the urinary um, excretion production of the different individuals throughout the whole day, and also uh, punctual um, samples at the first, uh, first thing in the morning. So we had, there was a lineal correlation in the two kinds of sample. So we selected the sample of the first, uh, of first thing in the morning because it was much more comfortable uh, for the patient and also to manipulate it at the level of a laboratory. If we thought about the levels of histamine and methyl histamine, we saw two things. There are no significant differences in the levels of histamine in, among both groups but there were significant differences in methyl histamine. So patients with symptoms had uh, lower levels of methyl histamine in their urine if we compared it with uh, the rest of the population. So we've been working to uh, amplify the study with other histamine uh, metabolic um, agents, but so far we've worked with this um, histamine and these are diagnostic approach is very uh, it's not very invasive we just need to have a urine sample uh, in the morning and ma like many other uh, clinical tests and uh, to finish there are two strategies and two studies that are being developed currently one of them is the study of uh, of intestinal microbiota uh, microbiota and the other one would be the um determination of biomarkers. They will talk about all of this in the round table. But I wanted to show you what the preliminary results were in a study that we are developing of the composition of intestinal microbiota. Microbiota, sorry. And we are wondering, could intestinal dysbiosis be a triggering factor of histamine intolerance? Or is there a relationship between that and intestinal microbiota? And we uh, studied patients with a control group and these uh, and the intolerance patients. We had these uh, uh, bacterial DNA uh, data about um, bacterial composition that we've been studying, but we have a preliminary result and it's that we have de detected significant differences in 21 genus and 30 bacterial species and if we compare the, uh, the two groups. So when we talked about uh, genus, it showed that the group with intolerance, we had a more abundance in 14 uh, bacterial genuses. And on the right, we see the differences at the level of bacterial species. Um, you know, we have many data and we are going step by step, but one example would be a higher presence of uh, enterobacteria. Uh, in intolerance, histamine intolerance population, and some species have been related with a, with a high capacity of uh, producing histamine, or at the level of species where we have a lower presence of bifidobacterium adolescentis, and if we compare it to other uh, bacteria, and these are species that have a very important probiotic character, and this is a beneficial um, effect on, on health. So we're seeing that there are differences that have to be studied and they have to be studied in uh, precise cases to, to study a profile of intestinal um, microbiota. And finally, and if we focus on the treatment, currently the main strategies are the uh, low histamine diet and the possibility of uh, supplementing with the uh, exogenous Dao enzyme. And for those, there are several studies that have assessed its efficiency in the field of low histamine diet, most of all, but more, more and more in the field of supplementation. And although these studies can have limitations in the number of size of the sample or the intervention time, all of these studies show that both strategies would be efficient to reduce the symptoms uh, due to this um, DAO deficiency. And the list of uh, novel foods that appear in 2017 included already the possibility to commercialize a supplement. And uh, so the formulation of a pig uh, kidney extract um, as a, as an, with these enteric, um, with these uh, encapsulated enteric coated pellets is being 
um, has. Also, we would have uh, an adequate analysis method to study the enzyme uh, Dao enzyme um, action as a concept. This is easy, but as it's a complex matrix where there are many other uh, enzyme activities, not all the methods are are useful. For example, here you see how histamine is degraded to aldehyde, consuming oxygen and producing ammonia and hydrogen peroxide. peroxide. So this would mean that we can show we should have to show the quantity on the ratio of uh, oxygen elimination would be. So these are subproducts of the reaction. We could measure that, and also in an indirect way, this histamine degradation would be calculated. We have to see that all the techniques that determine quantities of oxygen and, and hydrogen peroxide would be affected by other enzymes. And for example, an enzyme which is present in a pig kidney extract. Um, so we couldn't, we couldn't use only these kind of techniques. And also if we think about the substrate used by these techniques, uh, they use put, uh, putrescine and cadaverine, which have uh, similar structures, but they have a different activity from a DAO um, enzyme. So they're not indicating in a specific way this DAO activity on histamine. And we also can say that there is a radio immuno, uh, testing um, methods the um, work with radioactive material. The conclusion would be that we needed to have a, a appropriate method that would allow us to analyze a sample, for example, like the pig extract or other uh, DAO enzyme complements. And a work published in 2019, we developed and validated a method that would allow us to determine this DAO activity in this kind of samples using histamine as substrate. So specificity by histamine and also based on measuring how histamine would be degraded uh, throughout the time. These avoids the inter interference with uh, other enzymes and can be applied with a wide range of samples, different samples that are not very much purified. And to finish, I just wanted to say that in the topic of uh, supplementation and using this uh, method, we've been working with the possibility of identifying and getting new ways of work with it. And we were working with matrix that have uh, uh, vegetable origins. So uh, vegetables and in the case for example of peas and pea sprouts um, it's the same order the same one as the same one used with uh, pig kidney extract and this uh, method has allowed it to study the influence of the different uh, parameters of uh, of, uh, of uh, sprouting and this allows us to optimize the process with temperature humidity intensity of light etc to uh, get the highest DAO activity so we saw that certain kind of pulses or pulses, pulse sprouts were very interesting to have these DAO supplements, which were 100% vegetable based. That has a lot of uh, advantages at the level of uh, product targeting. So the, the wide range of population that would benefit from this. So this would be good for vegan, for vegetarians and for problems with certain kinds of dietary limitations, uh, which were religiously and religious based. So finally, this would be the key messages of my presentation. I would have to say that histamine intolerance is a disorder uh, due to the loss of the capacity of degradation of histamine at an intestinal level due to DAO deficiency, which could have a, a genetic um, or pathological origin. And having a consensus on the diagnosis, as we've seen, is a challenge ahead. Uh, we've been developing many uh, uh, much research to have different diagnosis methods, which are non-invasive and show the uh, highest uh, clinical validity. In the treatment, we have the two strategies, which is a low histamine diet and DAO supplementation. And in both cases, we're carrying out studies, clinical trials, assessing the efficiency of both and um, to see in the future how the different strategies could improve to treat this um, uh, disorder. And I would like to um, show you this special issue that we've been we're doing in, in our magazine. We're editing it from our research group. And there you can find some of the most recent works on DAO deficiency and histamine nutrients. It's an open access magazine with a good impact factor and you can very easily access it. You have this uh, QR code and you can have uh, access to the different work published. Or if you're researchers and you're working on this, in this uh, field of uh, research, uh, we would encourage you to publish your results and, and works, of course, in this special issue that will be open until the first uh, three months of the next year. 
And thank you so much for uh, being there. I'm sorry if I was a little bit, um, it was a little bit longer than I uh, had foreseen, but hopefully it, it has been a very interesting presentation and we continue with the rest of the conference. Thank you.